Good morning, members. Just to proceed uh, with the Sedan, if that's uh, uh, in order. Um, so, Councillor George Mayer. Here. Thank you. Councillor Ian Grant. Present. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Gordon Jenkins. Yes, I'm here. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor John McFadgen. Nope. OK. Uh, Councillor Maureen Mackay. Councillor Mackay. OK, I'll come back to Councillor Mackay. Councillor Helen Coffey. Here. Here. Thank you. I have an apology from Councillor John Campbell. Uh, Councillor Jim Todd. Here. Here. Thank you. Councillor Sally Cogley. Here. Here. Thank you. Councillor John Bell. Here. Thank you. Councillor Elaine De Moody. Here. Thank you. Can you check again for Councillor John McFadgen? Nope. And Councillor Maureen Mackay. Councillor Mackay. OK, um, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Chair. Uh, we're going to declarations of interest, if there are any. And if not, we'll proceed on to the previous minutes. Submit for approval the pre minutes of the meeting held on 30th of September. Can we agree that it's a true record? And any matters arising from it? No. So, Councillor Mackay, oh, Maureen, your hand seems to be up. We can't see you, but we think you've got your hand up. Disappeared now. I think we're having problems. I think Maureen's having problems actually joining us because we can't see her and she didn't respond to the Seder. Although aye, she had her hand up, but I don't know what's happening. We'll move on. We can come back to Maureen if there's anything. Uh, we're on to now item three in the agenda, the internal audit, mid-year progress report. And we'll ask Ailey to take this one. Thanks. Thanks, Ailey. Thanks, Chair. Good morning, members. <clears throat> the mid-year report is an established uh, mechanism for not only reporting our progress in line with statutory and regulatory requirements, but also in line with good practice to present a revised plan to committee at mid-year. And uh, as, you're, as you're all aware, the plan is a live plan and I have delegated authority to change the plan during the year in line with emerging risks. And that's uh, that's very much the case this year. So we're bringing a revised plan up for approval, uh, but that plan can change again before the year end. And we would report any changed position by the year end. Uh, I don't anticipate any significant changes prior to the, the year end. So the recommendations at section two, as usual, take you through the story of the report. So what I'll do now is I'll highlight some areas of the report that have informed the, the recommendations. So if I start at uh, the background section at paragraph three, you'll recall that committee approved the original plan on 22nd of April, and that was in line with our SIAS obligations, which are the, the national standards that apply to, to internal audit. And as you know, the scope of our work covers internal control, governance and risk. So it's not just about the pound signs, it's about everything the council does around that scope of work. As I mentioned, paragraph four highlights that we formally review the plan uh, at mid-year, and that's good practice. Good practice indicates you review your plan on a regular basis, and it was agreed some time ago by committee that every six months would be a, a good interval uh, for us, and I think that's still the, the right decision. If I can refer to paragraph six, there are some additional documents that support this report. 
uh, a number of the appendices are attached to this report, which show the progress and the changes to the plan. But there are a number of other appendices which lay out the statutory and regulatory detail of what we do. And those appendices are available on the councillor's notice board in the usual way. Uh, and the link is in the report to the notice board. And of course, our fully detailed assignment reports can also be found at that link. Going back now quite a number of years, uh, we, we've had that level of transparency for a good number of years now in this council. So our full internal audit assignment reports and reports for uh, the IGIB, including NHS reports, are held on the, the councillor's notice board. If I can move on to paragraph seven, which highlights the external audit reports that committee considered back in June and September of this year, those reports have informed the revised internal audit plan, primarily through the recommendations around establishing a tracker for the benefits from transformation and work around heritage assets. In addition to those recommendations, uh, external audit also identified a number of very positive references to our work in internal audit, which is always nice to see. Now, I'm not going to go through those bullet points in, in any detail other than to say they've picked up some key areas which I think are very important for the work that we do. The follow-up work has been recognised. We always have very high implementation scores on this council for the recommendations that internal audit make. It tends to be sitting about 100%. Uh, we work with services. I'm not a big believer in going in early and trying to score points by identifying what's not being done. There's no value in that to anybody. That still happens elsewhere in the country. We're not going to be doing that here and my, under my watch, certainly. So we work with services. Sometimes we need a wee bit more support. Sometimes, you know, the, the recommendations are fairly straightforward and can be implemented quickly. It's important we all work together. We're all working for the same people at the end of the day. So our recommendations tend to be implemented around about the 100% mark, and that continues to be the case this year. That's been our experience. External audit highlighted that in particular because during last year, when we had all sorts of other um, distractions in our work in the council, our recommendations were still being implemented. So internal control was still being prioritised by, by services. And that, that was recognised uh, as being a, a very positive aspect for, for this council. They've made references to our strong arrangements for fraud and particularly the role of internal audit. And we've gone into that in some depth before with committee, particularly around the COVID uh, arrangements. And I'll come on to that later today because that actually sits in quite stark contrast with what's happened nationally around uh, COVID assurance. We have also, uh, sorry, external audit have also identified the good work of this committee supported by internal audit around following the public pound. And my goodness, the environment we work in has got more and more complex year on year. Uh, when I started this job, I audited East Ayrshire Council. I now audit East Ayrshire Council, the IGIB, the East Ayrshire Leisure Trust. Uh, I'll start forgetting them now because I'm getting too old to remember. Uh, ARA and most, most uh, lately the Ayrshire Growth Deal, where I'm the, the coordinating chief auditor for the Ayrshire Growth Deal. So it's a much more complex environment. But I think it's the right thing that internal audit and this council oversee all those partnership arrangements. In some other councils, they've chosen to outsource the internal audit for some of those other partnership elements. So I think the way we are doing it is it, it allows for a, a, a better joined up approach, I think. And, you know, hopefully, hopefully we make uh, connections uh, where that's, that's useful. So it was good that external audit recognised that work of the committee around following the, the public pound. And external audit have also uh, identified that they had started to engage with us around looking at continuous improvement around the arrangements for heritage assets. And that's going to be a, a chunk of our work in the next six months of this year. 
Now, if I can touch on the, the techie stuff, uh, I mean, even I find this tedious as a chief auditor and I'm quite a geek around all this audit stuff. But paragraph eight refers to the special arrangements that were put in place by the Internal Audit Standards Advisory Board. And they only tend to get active when big things happen. So they got active when COVID happened and they said, internal audit, you might not be able to do your job to the same standard that you normally do it. So you might need to qualify your opinions for your individual jobs, or you might need to qualify your opinion for the council. We didn't have to do that last year. We were able to do sufficient work, and I anticipate that will be the case this year. Um, I recently did uh, a wee survey around the, the other councils, and 16 councils responded. So half the councils in Scotland responded to um, a benchmark that I carried out across various areas of internal audit. And one of the areas that we asked about was, did you have to caveat your annual opinion? So actually people did. Two out of those 16 who responded didn't get enough work done last year to give their council an internal audit annual opinion. Uh, so it has happened out there. We have been supported through COVID. Uh, some other internal audit teams have been disbanded effectively and their employees taken into other areas of the council. Uh, we have worked with people, but we've still been internal auditors and we've still been independent and we've still been able to, to do our work. So I think that's worked very well for us in this council. And that's not, not just down to my team, it's down to the, the wider support that we've had and particularly through the other statutory officers and uh, David as a monitoring officer and Joe as the, the proper finance officer in particular. If I can move on to some new professional guidance that's coming out, it's, it's a rare event for us to get additional pre professional guidance, but there's been a, a recent publication from SIPFA and I've posted that onto your uh, notice board and that's referred to at paragraph 12. So um, I think SIPFA may be a wee bit late to the party here, but uh, they're recognising that we do as councils now work in partnerships and collaborations and it's setting out good practice for internal audit in that environment. And I think the second bullet point is a really good summary of actually how we've worked over the last decade, which is the role of internal audit has changed significantly and we've strengthened our profile as advisors, consultants and critical friends. And an awful lot of the work, as you know, in our audit plan is underpinned by that approach. We're independent, but we work with you. And it's good that that's been recognised so strongly by our professional bodies uh, nationally. Paragraph 13 sets out the professional network activity. Um, I'm a member of the, the management committee of the chief auditors group, uh, which you know by that horrible uh, abbreviation, slacky ag. Uh, but I think uh, we all hate it, but we all love it in the same way. <laughs> and it's recognisable and it, it, you know, that's it it what it says. It's, the, it's all the local authorities in Scotland, chief internal auditors, and uh, we all meet and actually during during the last year and a half when the meetings have been virtual, our full quarterly meetings where all of the chief auditors are invited, it's pretty much been a full house. And we, we were nearly there before with the face-to-face the, the -to -face meetings, but we, we've got fantastic engagement now. And as you can see from table one, we continue to attract really good speakers. And I think if anything, we're actually getting a better range of speakers because people don't need to tramp about the country to come and visit us wherever we're hosting our meetings at that point in time. So, you know, there's a place for the face-to-face -face meetings and we'll revert to a blended model, but at the moment it's working really well. And those speakers have informed our audit plan. And I'll give you two examples. On the 23rd of April, we had uh, a very, um, a very useful presentation from the director of the Sustainable Scotland Network. And these presentations are more like little workshops uh, rather than you know somebody speaking to us. Uh, so the director very much engaged with us and he's on a journey at the moment with nas other national bodies to identify options for 
policing climate change declarations going forward. And Audit Scotland at the moment, it looks as if it's unlikely that they'll take on that role. So everything's pointing to that role being uh, sitting with internal audit. Uh, so that's yet to be decided nationally, but we don't. We always try to be in the front front foot front foot here. That's not easy to say. We always try and be in the front foot here. So we this year have uh, audited uh, elements of the climate change declaration that will be submitted to the Sustainable Scotland Network uh, later on this month, and I understand that's coming to cabinet later on this month. That's that's a huge piece of work. So we're doing it in a rolling cycle. Uh, I think it would have taken us more than a year to go and uh, check all the the evidence, but uh, we've we've done a good piece of work around that. If I can move down to the first of October meeting at the bottom of table one, uh, on page five, the cyber resilience uh, presentation was actually about SIPA. And the presentation was from the head of public sector cyber resilience at Scottish Government. And he's been a good friend to the chief auditors group. He's actually been a good friend to this council because he lives over the back of headquarters. <laughs> so he has worked with us uh, very closely over the years. Um, so he gave us a, a very good insight into the lessons learned from the SEPA issue. And that's been shared with... Uh, uh, equivalent IT networks uh, round about the same time. There is a national report that's anticipated from Scottish Government. That's been subject to a couple of delays so far. We're expecting that before Christmas. Let's see, let's see. But we've been given an incredible insight into the findings of that report because the, the head of public sector cyber resilience from the Scottish Government oversaw the SEPA identification of issues and the recovery from those issues. So we we will now be benchmarking with our IT colleagues our position in this council. Uh, but that journey actually has already started. Our IT colleagues were on that, as I would expect them to be, uh, from knowing their level of professionalism. They were on those lessons as soon as the SEPA uh, incident happened. Um, and we can never be complacent about the cyber threat, and everybody knows that. Um, I understand actually SEPA had quite good controls in place, uh, but we're still attacked. But there's still there's lessons to be learned, and uh, we'll we will be benchmarking those uh, independently um, later on this this year. So I think you can see the the advantages that we have of being involved in those those professional networks. If I can move on to paragraph 17 and 18, uh, which give you a wee bit of narrative around response, recovery and renewal. And I had gone into this, I got into this in some more detail last year, and I had posted a presentation that I had made to the council management team onto the councillor's notice board. And what I've carried out in the last few months, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I developed and coordinated a national survey to exchange experience. And other councils had very similar experiences to us. Um, there were some outliers, but uh, very similar uh, experiences during COVID. Uh, and as a result of that survey, we've now identified areas that nationally we're looking to support all of our teams to um, to thrive through our recovery and renewal. And that's particularly in the areas of agile auditing, uh, or as we're, the other phrase we refer to, which I think is more meaningful, is real-time auditing. So that was very much a part of what we did during COVID. We walked hand in hand with our colleagues, particularly in finance and economic development, as applications were coming in for grants, as they were being considered and then approved and paid, we were at every stage of that. And we're trying to use that embedded approach as much as possible at the moment. And I'll mention an example, uh, a recent example of that later on the, this morning. If I can move on to paragraph 21. So our progress to date, we measure our progress in two ways. We measure actual audit days delivered. So that's days actually working on audit assignments, as opposed to coming to committee, as opposed to managing the team. So it's days on the ground uh, actually delivering audit work, which is the bulk of what we do. 
It's what most of our days are allocated for. So we anticipated back in April, we would have about 950 days this year available. And we'll, we'll be there or thereabouts. Uh, at mid-year, we have achieved 50% of those days. So 479.5 days to be precise. <laughs> and we're very precise with this because we record our time to the nearest five minutes. Uh, we've got quite a sophisticated, enormous spreadsheet that we use to, and it, it just, it's, it's just part of what we do day to day. It doesn't take up much time to complete. It's a few minutes a day. And we record the detail of what we do each day because that informs us going forward and knowing how much time to allocate to, to future, uh, future jobs. And that's the kind of standard way of managing your audit time. But of course, what's more important is, and is highlighted at paragraph 22, is what we've done with the days. So appendices two and three in the report show good progress. Most jobs are started and uh, a number of the jobs are completed and those reports are on the councillor's notice board. And in table three, I've highlighted some of the areas uh, of work that we've, uh, we've been involved in in the first six months of, of this year. Item one, which was COVID-19 assurance and anti-fraud, that was a big block of time that we allocated to be able to provide uh, instant responses to issues that were coming up around the, the COVID-19 control environment. And so far this year, we have worked to uh, continue to oversee the, the last of the COVID grants and to tidy up some of the assurance around that. We've also carried out a review of COVID spend that was funded by the Scottish Government and uh, external audit were particularly interested in, in that work that we had done. And we concluded in sound assurance in most areas. Uh, we looked at the procurement of items and we looked at authorisation of orders and spend. And we, we had good processes in place and we can give the the Council and indeed the Scottish Government assurance in, in that area. If I can move on to item six, which is continuous auditing uh, and the comprehensive benefits tracker. Again, this was a chunk of time that we set aside to pursue our continuous auditing. And we've actually, we're, we're changing that a little bit this year to reflect on some of the lessons learned from the, the COVID experience. So we are now um, proactively creating exceptions reports for services. Previously, we were trying to support services to get their exceptions report uh, better and better. We'll still do that, but what we're going to do separately and independently is run data matches on various data's, uh, data sets in the council, identify anomalies and investigate those on a continuous basis. Uh, so we're at the beginning of that journey. I think that will work well and I think that's going to add, add value uh, to the assurance framework in, in the council. The, the time around uh, job number six will also be now used to support the head of corporate support in establishing the Transformation Comprehensive Benefits Tracker. Uh, and external audit have usefully set out some parameters of their expectations uh, around that, that work. So I'm anticipating that our work will be at the beginning and during that journey. So we'll be involved in the implementation of those arrangements and then in monitoring those arrangements. So basically, I, what I'm imagining is we'll be testing the evidence that sits behind that tracker uh, in the same way as we would do for uh, performance indicators, for example. Um, so if we can move on, small advisory item seven, we always set aside a wee chunk of time, and this is primarily for me to respond to queries coming up from services. Oh my goodness, this contingency is always well used, and that continues to be the case. And this is very much real-time auditing as well. I'll get a wee phone call from somebody saying, what do you think about this? And we deal with it right away. So I was even surprised myself when I looked at the list and we dealt with 48 queries, 48 referrals in the first half of the year. Now that only took nine days. Some of them are complex, but that doesn't necessarily mean they take a long time. So it's primarily myself with the support of the audit manager 
uh, who will work on, on those queries. And that really gives us an insight into where, uh, where there might be wider areas that we maybe want to look into in, in the future. So it really is a win-win, I think, for, for everybody. And I'm really, I'm always really happy that people see internal audit as being approachable um, because um, I know we're not always everybody's favourite people and sometimes we have, you know, we have difficult messages to, to communicate to people. But, you know, everybody, everybody, my experience in this council, everybody's open to that. Um, you know, it's difficult for some people and it's difficult to be told certain areas of your service might not be working as well. But it's important we do that and, and that um, it's important we continue to do that. Uh, item eight, don't worry, I'm not going to go through every single one of these in the table, but these are the key ones that just happen to be uh, sequential at the moment. Item eight, fact finding and investigations contingency. As you know, we always set aside a bit of time, quite a bit of time usually for fact finding, which might lead on to an investigation. In the past, that's been hundreds of days sometimes, you know, in an average year, maybe 150, 200 days. Um, that has really fallen off since last year and my colleagues and other councils are telling me they've had the same experience so we're, there's a national discussion at the moment about the possible reasons for that and i have set out some of the reasons in this report some of them positive and that we think in a lot of areas there might be reduced opportunity for fraud and we have escalated, certainly in this council, some of our digital solutions and particularly around creditors. And I think creditors is a really good example because um, we now we no longer have people signing off uh, uh, invoices. There's no requirement to do that as long as they come from the email address of the person who's an authoriser, that for me is a much stronger control. So we set that up with finance at the beginning of the pandemic, and that's you know it's it's, it's working it's working well. Uh, there's some room for improvement, but it's it's working well. I, I and it reminded me very much when I was looking at this lately, last March, just before we went into lockdown, I was down at Kilmarnock Sheriff Court as a witness in a case an employee in this council who had attacked one of the small vulnerabilities in the previous way that we used to process invoices. And it was caught. It was caught because we had good controls in place. Uh, but it was caught by finance. Uh, but he had, um, he had uh, um, fraudulently signed off an invoice. He pretended to be the authoriser. Uh, and that was caught fairly quickly because he'd also tried to divert it into his own bank account. So these things are caught and we, we actually check those controls every year in finance. And in fact, I think the last few years is going to stand in joke now with finance. We can never find anything to recommend to make it better. <laughs> But uh, <laughs> it's always a frustration for auditors. But uh, you know we have we have good controls around that area. But they're even better now, I think, because we have escalated the digital solutions around the the processing of of invoices. So there will be an element of improved controls. But at the same time, nationally, we are concerned that COVID may have led to reduced management oversight. It may have led to a reduced inclination to report things to internal audit. Now, that's something we are very aware of on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I'm not seeing any strong evidence of that at the moment in this council, but it is something that nationally we're very much tuned into. And we, we are working very closely with our counterparts and other councils to share, share experience there. And I'm going to move down now to item 18 on, on this table, the Ayrshire Growth Deal. And as you know, since uh, the Ayrshire Growth Deal started to emerge, uh, internal audit have been involved uh, in, in helping to develop the governance arrangements. And as you know, uh, I'm the chief auditor for the Ayrshire Growth Deal, which basically means I coordinate the plans for the three councils and report them to the Ayrshire Growth Deal and report the outcomes of all the internal audit work by the three councils to, to the deal as well through the, the joint committee. And we're very much at the beginning of that journey with, uh, with the joint committee. In terms of more local work, we have recently embedded one of our internal audit team with the 
uh, Programme Management Office, which, as you know, is the, the team of four uh, who are involved in managing the Ayrshire Growth Deal. And they're based in uh, at East Ayrshire Council, employed by East Ayrshire Council, but cover the, the whole scope of the deal. So they are coordinating the work within the three councils. And uh, you may remember Alison Craig, I know, has made uh, presentations to members uh, previously. And there's some very good um, monitoring reports that are reported uh, by Alison uh, to the Joint Committee. Um, so we are overseeing the work at the moment, but very much trying to make that real time auditing again. So recently we walked through the quarter two claim to the governments. Uh, and generally procedures were good, a couple of continuous improvement areas, as, as there will always be. Uh, but we, are, we, we tend to use the phrase with the PMO that we're their phone a friend, and that's how we try and work, work with them. But it's advisory and assurance. So, you know, we don't lose our independence by being embedded. Um, I have been a couple of times, um, a couple of times colleagues have called me the smiling assassin because we work very well with you, then we make recommendations. Well, that's the name of the game. That's what we're all about. But we will work with you and we'll never tell you something that we haven't discussed with you. So, but it tends to, it's, it's working well. It's working well. Uh, so if I can move on. Um, item 28 just outlines the work that we've done for the East Ayrshire IJB. As you know, I'm the chief auditor for the IJB as, as well, and our audit manager takes a lead uh, on that, that work. And you'll remember back in September, uh, I brought up the annual update report to Governance and Scrutiny Committee, and we shared the annual report for 2021 for the IJB, and we shared the audit plan for the IJB for 21-22, which we're currently working on. And we work very closely with our colleagues in the NHS uh, to achieve the IJB work. Uh, and I, I have to, I have to uh, take on board the work that's carried out by the NHS internal audit team to prepare my annual opinion for the IJB. So that's very much a, a partnership and that, that's, that, that works well. I'm highlighting that because at paragraph 23, uh, I've highlighted the following the public pound work that we do generally. So as I mentioned earlier, we provide following the public pound support for this committee uh, with our work not only in the IJB, but the Leisure Trust, the Ayrshire Roads Alliance and the Ayrshire Growth Deal. So, and I think, uh, I think at the moment we do try uh, where we can benchmark that to what's happening nationally. And I think our arrangements are as good as, if not better uh, than elsewhere. But, you know, I'm certainly not complacent about that. And there's always room for improvement. Um, audit Scotland did hold up our IGIB internal audit model a number of years ago at the beginning of the IGIBs as being best practice. So that, that was a nice reassurance at the time because <laughs> it was new for all of us. And just like, oh, Jings, how are we going to do this? Uh, and my, my view is always uh, simple is usually more effective, targeted, simple. And uh, that's, uh, I think uh, it may not seem uh, simple to some people coming into it for the first time, but I think what we've got is transparent and hopefully uh, is clear to the, the readership of the work that we, we produce. So revisions to the plan, paragraphs 24 to 29 and table four. Table four summarises the revisions that have been made at mid-year. So we've got the additions, uh, and I've touched on uh, a couple of these areas already today. Uh, probably the, the biggest items in there are the heritage assets um, and the lessons from SEPA. And we're bumping other items in the plan to accommodate them because they are now a higher priority for us. So the stuff that we're bumping, the deferrals, are listed at the bottom of the table and with an explanation beside each item uh, to inform uh, committee in making a decision around the revised audit plan. Generally, the items are at the lower end of the risk spectrum. 
and they have been discussed with the relevant uh, heads of service. They have also been discussed with the chief executive. Now, the only two items that don't sit at towards that lower end of the risk spectrum, or they didn't earlier in the year, are items 26 and 27, which were planned jobs for the Health and Social Care Partnership. But on a balance of risk, now is not the right time for internal audit to begin in and doing big pieces of work with the Health and Social Care Partnership. They have other priorities at the moment. That doesn't mean that governance, internal control and risk isn't a priority for them. It very much is. I have regular updates with Craig MacArthur as Director of Health and Social Care. And in fact, we, we had our most recent update yesterday morning. Craig has reinforced to his team that any recommendations that internal audit have made up until now, which haven't been implemented yet, are still a priority and they absolutely have to be implemented. And there's actually a number of them that are due to be implemented during this year. And there were three follow-up exercises that we were going to do towards the end of this year to look at uh, those recommendations. They will now move into the beginning of next year. And my view is that that is not creating a significant risk for us as a council on the whole balance of risk. I think the bigger risk would have been for us to divert officer time in the health and social care partnership at this point in time. So we're not doing any new jobs with the health and social care partnership for the moment. And we're only talking a matter of months uh, for the rest of this year, this uh, financial year. We will, however, still be working with our colleagues in health and social care because we still have to do the audit work for the IGIB. It's such a small audit plan that we really have to do it. We have to do all of it to get sufficient work to have an opinion. So it's not it's not a world that we're, we're walking away from. We're just prioritising with the Director of Health and Social Care at the moment. If I can move down to risk implications at paragraphs 35 to 39. And as members know, there's always, uh, there's always the risk that we don't get sufficient work done to create an annual opinion. The, my statutory function is to create an annual opinion. And we try and do that by creating a lot of added value for the council in that journey to get to the annual opinion. And, and hopefully we manage to do that. As I said earlier, uh, at the halfway point in the year, we've achieved half the days in the plan. It's kind of where you would expect us to be. That's, that puts us in a good position because we've nearly done 500 days so far. And in other councils, they've based annual opinions on not much more than 500 days. So at this current point in time, even if we were to have a level of turnover in the team, I am confident that we can carry out sufficient work this year to inform an annual opinion for 21-22. And Chair, I think I'll stop there on what I think is a relatively positive note for us this year. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Ailey, for our usual comprehensive report. I'll throw it open to members. Do we have any comments or questions? I see uh, Councillor Grant, and you've got your hand up. Yes. Um, now, unusually for me, I've written something down um, because I want to get the words absolutely right. Uh, what I've written down is internal audit are not an outside source. You are an outstanding resource, and uh, I just like uh, I'm sure I, I'm in line with everyone else in the committee in thinking that, and I just hope you'll take that home with you and you also pass it on to your superb team. Thank you very much for all your efforts this year. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Councillor Todd, Jim. Uh, thanks, you know, uh, again, Ellie, uh, great report. Uh, and please pass on uh, our regards to you and all your staff. Um, you've done a brilliant job uh, looking after uh, the council's uh, good name and the uh, council finances. And uh, it's a pity that um, in another place down at Westminster couldn't follow your example and your team's example of looking after uh, councillors, officers, audit. Um, it's absolutely shocking what's going on down there. Um, We'll come back to that at a later date. 
but well done for keeping East Ayrshire Council's name uh, up there at the forefront. Thank you. Thanks, thank you. Uh, Maureen, Councillor Mackay. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Chair. Again, I just wanted to to thank Ailey. Um, Ailey, you make it sound as if it's incredibly easy to just take on all of these different diverse aspects of the work that you described in some detail to us. Um, it's a huge ask and particularly in this time of COVID and again other people have expressed their thanks uh, to your teams but at the end of the day you know just looking for an assessment as to how do you feel that your teams are bearing up in relation to all of this additional work across this really diverse areas? Chair, through you. Um, well, first, thank you everybody for those those kind words. That's always that's always good to hear. Uh, yeah, we we do we do. I think all of us have a number of sleepless nights about various aspects of all of our jobs. Um, I think, um, it, and it's a good point in terms of that diversity of what we've done in terms of the partnership working, I don't think we're any different from particularly any other uh, support service in the council, although I always, uh, I always say we're the, we're the assurance service as opposed to a support service, but we, we fall into the same category. Um, that it's, it's been difficult for all of us and, you know, we've really had to go back to our experience, our professionalism. Uh, quite often we haven't had national guidance to tell us what to do. It tends to come quite late in the day for a lot of the new arrangements that are put in place. But we always go back to first principles. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite old in the tooth now with this and I've done internal audit for years. I've worked in some really complex environments. Um, and uh, I've worked in non-audit environments that are quite complex as, as well. Uh, so all, all those skills come to bear. My, my team have got mixed backgrounds, so that, that helps as well. You know, they've, they've worked in various uh, organisations, but it, it still it hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy. And uh, one of the... Well, one of the conversations I'm having at the moment with the chief exec is about the resourcing of the team because we have taken on more and more and more. Uh, and actually our numbers have reduced slightly, only slightly. We have been relatively protected in terms of cuts within the council, but we are at a sort of critical mass at the moment, uh, which needs needs to be needs to be looked at. So that, that conversation is is ongoing at the moment. But, uh, and I particularly like my involvement. It sometimes frustrates the life out of me, my involvement in the National Committee, because uh, it doesn't move fast enough for me sometimes, and I get quite impatient, but uh, it, it, it has proved invaluable. And the benchmarking and the generosity of colleagues and other councils and sharing their experiences gives me a lot of assurance that actually we're getting it right, and we're getting it right most of the time. We, you know, there's areas where, uh, where we, you know, there'll be gaps, there'll be gaps, inevitably there'll be gaps. But I think that we're able to prioritise and we're able to target our time quite well uh, because of the support we get in this council. And as I mentioned earlier, particularly from the other statutory officers in the council that help to keep us all, I think, pointing in the right direction. So I hope that is not just about the internal audit team, it's about the environment we work in as well. Uh, and that, that's important, not just, not only that internal, but external environment as well, and all that support we get through both, um, both aspects. So I hope that answers your question, Councillor Mackay. Thank you. Uh, th no, thank, thank you, Ailey. Uh, that, that, that's helpful and again, detailed. And that's really what we have got to a stage where that's what we expect of you and you always deliver for us. Thank you. Thanks, Maureen. Uh, I don't see anyone else. Oh, sorry, Sally. Councillor yeah, Cogley. Yeah. Yes, uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I mentioned in your comments about time allocation 
and that you have to record your time to the nearest five minutes. And I have to say, if I did that, it would fill me with absolute dread as one of the world's biggest fatters and procrastinators. How do people do that? Because I, I, I think that would be very, very difficult. Through, through you, Chair, uh, auditors are used to it. It's the world we work in. It's the world you're, uh, you're introduced to in your early days in auditing. Um, we, it, it just becomes part of your day. You've got your, your timesheet open constantly on your laptop. And every time you work, it, it's very unusual to go down to that five minutes. Uh, it tends to be only me that's maybe in that level of detail, depending on how much time I'm, things I'm juggling. Most people in the team will maybe be juggling maybe two, three jobs in the day. So they'll maybe have two hours on something, three hours on something, two hours on something else. But everybody's very, very aware that we are one of the measures uh, we have is audit days which is compiled from those detailed timesheets that are um, that are maintained on a daily basis. We um, and that also links into our national performance indicator, which I bring to the, bring to you at the year end. So it's actually a, a national indicator uh, through the the SIPFA Scottish Directors of Finance uh, that were compared uh, every year how many days you've actually achieved in your plan. We're always up in the kind of top uh, the top quartile in that because we tend to achieve slightly more. But that, that won't always be the case. But it's, it's just, it, it's, it's part of the regime. It's part of what we do. And uh, certainly in the private sector, it's something that's very well established because obviously it links into their billing there. <laughs> so anybody yeah. that's come from the private sector, I think, has even done it down to maybe a, a, even more granularity perhaps than we do it. But uh, it gives me good management information. It tells me what people are spending their time on, where they might be spending a bit too much time in some areas or maybe not spending enough time. And we can then quickly uh, start to you know, redirect uh, people's time. So. It's, it's useful, it's a huff too because of a national indicator, but actually it's useful in terms of management information and it's not a big overhead, absolutely not a big overhead. And it's just part of the audit world. People expect to do it. Any audit team you join, you'd expect to do that. So it's just part of our world. And I, I suspect it will be for some time to come. Thank you. Thanks, Ellie. I don't see any other hands up members. So if there's no one else, can we... I can refer you to the recommendations. They're on page nine and leading on to page 10 uh, of your papers. They're mainly for noting, but I would refer specifically to Roman numeral 11, which is to approve the revised internal audit plan that we've heard about uh, and otherwise note uh, the other items in the report. Can we move the recommendations? Don't see any dissent, so we'll take it as read. Thank you for that. We're now moving on to the next item in the agenda. Uh, at page 38, the, again, the report by the Chief Auditor, uh, this time on the Corporate Fraud Team. So we're back on to Ailey. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Much shorter report this time. Uh, so again, this is an established report um, updating members on the work of the, the corporate fraud team. Again, the recommendations that sort of tell the, the story. So this report's for noting. The background, which I think you're all aware of, is laid out in paragraphs three to seven, noting at paragraph seven that back in June, Cabinet extended the partnership arrangement with North Ayrshire Council until 31st of March 2025, which gives us another good run at, uh, at that um, partnership. The paragraphs 8 to 13 lay out the roles and responsibilities uh, for the prevention and detection of fraud, because we've all got a responsibility in this. It's not just uh, the corporate fraud team. They have a role, but the responsibilities uh, lie with management, an element with internal audit, and uh, corporate fraud teams support us in that, that work. Um, it's The question I get asked probably most frequently is, What's the difference between internal audit and the corporate fraud team? Uh, the difference is that internal auditors are not expected to have the same uh, investigation knowledge as somebody who's an investigator. 
who's in the corporate fraud team. So your investigators will go into a great deal of detail about, um, for example, um, council tax, uh, potential fraudulent single person discount. So they'll be investigating those, re those types of referrals. Whereas my team, who are all accountants, are looking at controls in the bigger uh, council tax system. So they're complementary and we can learn lessons from the referrals to the corporate fraud team, but they are different roles and responsibilities. Uh, and uh, corporate fraud team members tend to be, at the moment, the, the profile of the corporate fraud team is half of them are former house and benefit investigators that sat in councils when councils had that responsibility. The other half actually in our corporate fraud team at the moment are ex-polis. So it's quite a traditional, it seems to be coming quite a common home for retired polis across the country, which is really useful. And they, you know, they bring particular skill sets. In fact, one, one of the retired um, police officers in the Ayrshire corporate fraud team, in the, the, the North and East Ayrshire corporate fraud team, uh, was based previously in the Police Scotland's uh, forensic accounting unit. So brings you know, a really strong background there. Um, and uh, so we, we benefit we benefit from a lot of the retiral program <laughs> in Police Scotland. So that that's been useful, but it is it is very much different roles and responsibilities. Um, and it, the corporate fraud team sits under me at the moment because that's probably the best place for it to sit. It could sit in finance, you know, there are other places where it could sit, but uh, it's, it's as good a match as any sitting with internal audit. And there has been that complementary role. Paragraph 11 uh, just lays out, and I'm sure members are, are very aware of the scope of the work that the corporate fraud team do. And this uh, is subject to a legal agreement between East Ayrshire Council and North Ayrshire Council. So council tax, business rates, Scottish welfare fund, discretionary house and payments, blue badges and house and tenancies. And what's been added on to that for the last year is supporting us in investigations around COVID grants. And we've reported on that previously to uh, committee. The corporate fraud team also usefully acts as the first point of contact for the National Fraud Initiative. And that is really useful because that was quite a drain in resources when this council did that element itself. We are still responsible for our involvement in the National Fraud Initiative. But what the corporate fraud team do is the day to day stuff the stuff that was taken up an awful lot of time and people, particularly in our finance service. So they coordinate the exercise, but the detailed investigations of any matches from the National Fraud Initiative are done within this council by the relevant service. Uh, so that that that's that's been working that's been working well. Uh, and my team oversee that just to make sure that, that that's working well across the board, both within this council and within the the corporate fraud team. So, I mean, the kinds of referrals I've mentioned earlier about council tax, single person discount tends to be quite a common referral. Uh, Scottish Welfare Fund, there can be referrals about potential duplicate applications or disposals of goods, white goods, uh, other furniture. Uh, those sort of referrals uh, tend to come in. So, if we move on to paragraph 16, uh, which highlights the, um, the appendices. Now, the cover report is from me. Appendix one is from my equivalent at North Ayrshire Council, who is telling us about the achievements of the team. And then appendix two is mine, which uh, where I consolidate all the achievements of the corporate fraud team over the years, because I think it's useful to see that cumulative overview particularly as you can investigate a referral in, in one year, but perhaps the recovery doesn't come until the next year. So, you know, things don't, things don't fit neatly into a financial year uh, uh, from time to time. So, and I actually think it's useful having that overview at Appendix 2, particularly because of the impact of COVID, which I'm going to come on to. So paragraph 17 highlights that the referrals for East have reduced during COVID. And you can see that from uh, Appendix 2. So in the first six months of this year, there's been 60 referrals to the corporate fraud team. 
at this point last year, there were 61 referrals. So, you know, pretty much a yeah, muchness. But the the year before that, prior to prior to the impact of COVID, in the full year, there was 186. And if I remember rightly, that kind of split pretty even. So there was about 90 at mid-year. So we're sitting about a third less for the last two years. Now, we've been working over the last couple of weeks with uh, our colleagues in communications and there is a, a press release has been prepared uh, which the chair uh, is endorsing and that will go out to raise awareness. North Ayrshire referrals are significantly higher but that has always tended to be the case and it's also tended to be the case that although there's been less referrals for East they've always been of a higher quality. Uh, now, the recoveries at the moment, though, aren't terribly good. But again, th this is actually quite a complex picture because low recoveries can mean that your controls are good. And there's one particular example of that going back a few years where a proactive exercise in another council uh, recouped a quarter of a million pounds for council tax. Exactly the same exercise was carried out for this council by the corporate fraud team with no recoveries because our arrangements were so tight that there, there were no issues. So sometimes where a corporate fraud team make a high level of recoveries, it can mean that that council's got weak controls. Now, I can't make that exact a conclusion at the moment about the low number of referrals and the low number of recoveries. There is likely to be a COVID element in there, I think, in terms of, you know, possibly fraud hasn't been at the top of people's agenda and fraud against the council perhaps hasn't been at the top of people's agenda. We are doing some awareness raising. Later on this month, we've got International Fraud Awareness Week and there will be a heightened social media campaign by the corporate fraud team around that as well. So we'll watch it for the next period of time. We'll look for uh, patterns. We'll dig down a bit more to try and understand what's going on here. But the team are still very active. Um, they have been restricted in their proactive work because of COVID restrictions. In previous years, we would have had them out and about, chatting in doors, trying to find out if you know if your property really is empty. Uh, and there's been there's been restrictions around that, and uh, we're waiting on North Ayrshire Council confirming what the the team will be allowed to do going forward. But the team are, are you know very active. We're still getting referrals in. I think possibly the position um, can be improved this year and hopefully will improve going forward. But it is, is very much a, a watching brief. If I can move on to paragraph 20, the National Fraud Initiative, I've, I referred to this earlier today in the passing, and you'll remember, we, we've spoken at some length before about the anti-fraud work that internal audit did around the COVID grants. And we led on a pan Ayrshire data matching exercise. And that was comparing all the data sets for all the grant payments made in Ayrshire on behalf of the Scottish Government. And that was 125 million. So we initially, by matching all those data sets, got just over 2,000 matches now, most of them were spurious. For example, we had loads of bank account matches because lots of businesses were represented by the same agent who was using their bank account. So we had loads of grants going into the same bank account, but actually when we investigated it, it was fine. There was a reason. We ended up, I think, we, was it one or two? I think we had to, I think we had to recover one or two grants. That they, it, it's, it, it was so little that I can't even remember the detail. It was, it was at the margins. It was, we did not have a significant, significant issue with fraud in this council around the COVID grants. And the work that we've done, as you know, has been uh, recognised by external audit. So as far as I'm aware, I think we're still the only area in Scotland that did that regional data match. Everybody else was waiting for the NFI. And the NFI took the same data sets that we did, but they took it for the whole of the UK. So they've reported back to us twice now. 
Uh, they've had to run it twice because it didn't work very well the first time. So they've run it twice. It's not entirely clear if they're finished, but they should be finished by now. They're way beyond their, their deadline date. And to be honest, running data matches at more than a year after you've paid out grants, mm, not sure that's particularly useful for anybody, but lots of people across the country were relying on the NFI to at least get assurance. The number of matches for this council through the NFI have been five, which I think is in very stark contrast to the 2000 we got for East Ayrshire alone through our Pan Ayrshire matches. So to me, there's something no quite right with what's happened nationally. So next month, the chief auditors are meeting with the lead for the NFI in Scotland uh, to have a discussion around this and see, you know, what what happened? You know, is there any anything else we're going to get out of it? I had hoped to get assurance that they were picking up the same matches that we had picked up and we that would have given us an additional level of assurance. I don't know if we're going to get that. I think it's unlikely uh, at this point in this point in the year. But uh, we will bring the outcomes of the NFI. You know, NFI is not just about COVID. That was the extra bit they added on for the current exercise. And uh, they still do, you know, the usual uh, matches uh, and, uh, you know, around payroll and around council tax and around rates. So those are being those matches are being investigated at the moment. There's not a lot of them either. We we in this council though don't expect to get a lot of matches. We tend to get not a lot of recoveries through NFI, but we get a lot of assurance because it normally tells us that what we're doing is quite good. And that's really valuable for me. I'm not sure how much we can take out of it this year because I'm now slightly concerned about the methodology of the whole exercise. But you know, we can we can um, we can review that in due course once we get the national report, and we always share the national report with committee, and that will be that will be due out in a, a number of months. Um, so, if I can just move on, paragraph twenty one, external audit um, reported on the uh, positive report on the arrangements for fraud. Uh, and again, noting the involvement of internal audit. I can't resist mentioning that again because it was such a positive report for us. Um, so forgive me for mentioning that again. Um, and I think that's everything that I need to say on that report, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Hayley. <clears throat> Another good report, very comprehensive. I could maybe ask you uh, one question just for my own edification. In page 40, paragraph 10, it talks about the council's defalcation policy. I've never heard that word. Uh, to my knowledge, I don't know. I've, I don't think I've ever heard the word. Perhaps you could explain that. Thank you. No problem, Chair. Uh, what was that? Posh for, posh for thieving. I was going to say it's posh for when bad things happen. <laughs> it's a legal word, I think, David. Yes, it's a legal word. Aye. So basically, it covers fraud and corruption. It's it's the word. Maybe we need to look at changing the word. David and I are already planning to refresh the policy, so we can maybe look at changing that word. If you know, it's it, it's quite it's quite an old-fashioned term now. But aye, that's it. Fraud and corruption, Stephen. <laughs> I, I think I think, Chair, it's meant to convey where, uh, given the context, where it involves not just direct theft, you know, theft by finding in the street. The defalcation element is where someone in a position of trust has abused that trust or breached that trust and taking advantage of their position of trust to uh, help themselves. So it's in the context of everything Ailey's presented, policies, procedures, systems, and the defalcation element is where it's someone that's in on the inside, if you like, abusing their position employment in, in, in terms of employment to, to, to further their own personal gain. So it's a kind of specific group within the broader category of theft or, or, or fraud. Uh, it's particularly where it's inside and our policies and procedures are geared up to that. Thanks, David. I must have led a sheltered life. Uh, do we have any questions from the membership? I don't see anything, so could I refer you then to the recommendations on page 38? It's mainly to note uh, the contents of the report. 
So can we agree the recommendations? Thank you. Sorry, we are now moving on to the last item in the agenda, which is the... Sorry, once I find it. It's the concluded property transactions. Report by uh, Chief Governance Officer David's here. I'm sure he'll be able to answer any questions uh, that the members have. But I'll put it over to David. Thank you. Thanks, Chair and members, and I'll be brief. As members are aware, this report comes on a regular basis. It forms part of our suite of governance arrangements, if you like, uh, in the spirit of open and transparency, openness and transparency in how we conduct our business. As the report sets out, occasionally Cabinet will approve uh, either disposals or acquisitions above certain high thresholds, uh, but in the main, a lot of this is carried out under delegated authority. Uh, we sign off by myself and Joe uh, for respective legal and financial interests, and uh, because it's done under delegation, there's not the same visibility in terms of our decision-making arrangements. So to allow folk to see how and who we do business with, then we bring this on a regular basis uh, to put it in the public domain uh, so that there's, there's, there's that openness, as I say, and transparency about the business that's been done uh, in exercise of delegated powers. The uh, fact that it was a COVID year is obviously impacted, but not to the extent you might think. And what you see is still quite a range of either disposals in Appendix A or acquisitions in Appendix B. Generally, some of these are one-offs, uh, some of them are surplus property, and some of them reflect uh, the change in housing approach over the last couple of years, whereby uh, there has been a marked uptake in activity because we're either disposing of one or two uh, in a four in a block where we can't have total control uh, of the, the ownership rights, or we are uh, going in the opposite direction and acquiring one or two where we can to consolidate four in a block ownership, four out of four, uh, as part of the agreed housing policy. So a lot of these, either the disposals or the acquisitions, reflect uh, buildings going one way or the other on behalf of the housing service. Uh, the ones in page 48, uh, obviously there, Chair, you, you'll have an interest in Golson Primary School. I think that was the fields beside the schoolhouse, but I think Mr Murdoch also has the schoolhouse. So the aspiration there is, is that whatever development goes on there will also uh, lead to the schoolhouse being brought back into life as part of the broader development in the ground nearby. And hopefully that's taking place. The next one there at Luger, and I'm not going through them all, but the next one at Luger just marks uh, two positives. One, it's the council's removal of its, itself and its presence from uh, our former base up at Luger. And two, that sale was to a business on that site, uh, admittedly pre-COVID with expansion plans, but hopefully still with those plans and aspirations to expand their business. So that was a win-win uh, for both us and, and the, that particular business. And the next one was actually to support a new start-up business there. It was to be hairdressers, although it was impacted just at the beginning of COVID. Uh, and I've not been down for a wee while, so I don't know if it's actually up and running yet, but I'll check next time I'm down the town. And then the other ones at the end are mainly housing. And again, with acquisitions, as you can see, there was a small area ground required to deliver on the car park in New Mills, and the rest of those were the in deliverance of the housing policy to re re-establish full ownership of the four and a blocks, uh, or or give them up if we can't, you know, give up where we've got maybe one or two the minor interest, and we can consolidate it. So that's that's what sits there, and you'll also be familiar with the, the particular decisions taken around St Cuthbert Street in Catherine by Cabin it previously and you'll see a number there where we're either trying to uh, acquire enough to bring some of them down or or to, to consolidate our ownership there so that's a quick run through if there's any other questions i'm glad to say chair that there's nothing in here in respect of a certain mast in golson telecommunication mast so any any land transaction that took place in respect to that must have been since march 21. thank you david Members, do you have any questions? So the report is just for noting. Can we agree to note the report? And that uh, concludes this morning's meeting. So thank you for your attendance, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Bye. Thank you. Bye.